Hello everyone, hopefully you can, you can hear me. My name's Phil O'Brien and welcome to the Raymond Williams Society uh, lecture about to be delivered by the writer Lindsay Hanley. We're honoured that Lindsay is not only delivering the lecture to Mark Williams's centenary, but also doing so in memory of a friend and fellow writer, Don Foster, who passed away in July this year. The Society aims to expand and build on the work of Williams and the kinds of thinking and writing which, as a leading socialist intellectual of the 20th century, his work made possible. Something Lindsay will touch upon tonight and something the writing of Lindsay and Dawn has done, exploring issues of class, inequality and mobility, amongst many other things. So this is the first of three online events planned. Next Wednesday at the same time, we have uh, Daniel Hartley, one of the most important contemporary thinkers on Williams, giving a lecture on Williams and method. And then on Wednesday, November 17th, Madhu Krishnan, Paul Stasi and Anna Cornblu will discuss their recent collection, Raymond Williams at 100. We'll also be running an in-person conference in Manchester on April 22nd and 23rd uh, next year. The call for papers is now on our, our website, raymondwilliams.co.uk. So please join us for, for all or, or any of that and consider becoming a member of the society. Again, you can do that via our website. Not only will you then be supporting the increasing engagement with Williams's uh, work, but we'll also re uh, receive our annual journal, Keywords, a Journal of Cultural Materialism. So I'm sure many of you know Lindsay's work. She's one of the leading nonfiction writers on class uh, and working class life in Britain, explored in books such as Estates and Intimate History and Respectable, Crossing the Class Divide. She currently has a documentary uh, on Radio 4 this week looking at the housing crisis and uh, regularly writes for The Guardian, Tribune and, and Jacobin amongst others. So uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, thanks for joining us. And uh, it's lovely to see you know, so many of you to mark this, one of our many events to mark the centenary of Williams, Williams's birth. Uh, and thanks to, to Lindsay for agreeing to, uh, to de deliver the, the lecture for us. So over to you, Lindsay. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just attempt to share the screen because I have some slides um really as a as a way of kind of prompting my own thoughts and reflections uh, on this um i warned um phil earlier that uh, i had spent many weeks attempting to write um an extremely linear and uh, possibly quite olympian uh uninterrupted hour long uh lecture uh in the in the in the old school style um and actually found myself lost for words um i think um to begin with i'm extremely grateful but but was also quite daunted uh by the prospect uh not only of speaking about raymond williams but also as it emerged um in July, um, that the news of Dawn Foster's death. Uh, Dawn is somebody who I was very close to, um, both as a journalist and, and and as a friend and a sort of um, a, a sort of an ally in the uh, extremely unforgiving world of national journalism. Uh, in spite of our age difference, we were 12, 12 years apart in age. But um, my the, the the fact that I was daunted by it kind of led me to believe that I was somehow not uh, not equal to the task, I think, of talking about Williams. Um, you know, who is someone who has an extraordinarily valued and, and high reputation and somebody who himself was never lost for words, at least what we you know from what we know in his uh, extended recorded interviews and and his media work as well as as well as his criticism um but it gradually dawned on me or struck me that the format of the uninterrupted hour long lecture is something from a time when people could uh, particularly men could take weeks and months to think about things in a very inter uninterrupted fashion and be able to deliver these in a kind of AJP Taylor style way 
um, almost as if off the top of their heads. Uh, and I began to think of the realities of my life and the realities of Dawn's life. Um, Dawn is somebody whose um, illness, uh, she had epilepsy and a chronic, um, chronic spinal um, problem. Um, the severity of which became gradually worse over, over the course of her life. The the the, the fact that um, she lacked a lot of support, she lacked um, family support, she lacked financial support in the sense that she, she really, really struggled to make a living from freelance writing. Um, all of these things, I think, contributed to a, a, a real difficulty in making the full contribution that she had to give. And so in the end, I abandoned, uh, for better or worse, I abandoned the prospect of writing, uh, you know, an hour long lecture, you know, to be read off the page, as it were. Um, and just realised that the the sort of the obstacles in the way to it were structural uh, as much as personal not just to do with imposter syndrome but also to do but also to do with uh, the realities of uh, a, a, a parenting uh, parenting in a in a pandemic uh, the realities of, of of freelance work at home at a time when everything has been condensed into the home um and the, the the, just the, the, the general uh, difficulties of separating work life and personal life uh, and, uh, and and domestic, necessary domestic tasks. Now, Williams had things to write and to say about all of these things. And continually, all the time that I was trying to work on this lecture, I was constantly thinking to us, oh, I must, I must text Dawn about this. I must send Dawn a text message about this. What would Dawn say about this? And then constantly being brought up against the reality that she is no longer here to bounce those ideas off, to share those often quite minimal seeming, but but really quite pervasive uh, struggles of, uh, of, of freelance, uh, of, of freelance work, of uh, being from a non-traditional uh, background in national media. These are things that we all shared. And these are some of the things that I hope to kind of touch on in a series of sort of reflections and thoughts, mainly based from quotes that I've gathered from both mine and Dawn's um, favourite writers and people, that, and people whose work that we uh, both gained masses, massive amounts of, of, of uh, succour and um, intellectual food from, uh, as well as as well as Williams. So, I will just attempt to share this screen now. And hope that you can all see that. There. Um. So I was asked to do this, I was asked to give this talk before Dawn's death um, and yet um, finding out about her passing seemed to completely dominate um, how I began to feel about, about Williams' work. Afterwards, um, a book that we shared uh, a great love for and a great sort of um, affinity for was the novel Border Country um, and I think that was because of issues of uh, geographical mobility and social mobility and the kind of interrupted mobility that we both that we both shared um, and I think what I wanted to sort of talk about today was the, the sense that um, the things that we shared can be can be illustrated in in a number of in a number of um, hi. Sorry about that, everyone. I think Lindsay's had an issue with a 
a connection at her end and a, a problem with the slides. So uh, I'll I'll get wait till she gets gets back and then we'll we'll uh, we'll go from there and I'll just ask some I'll ask some questions because she was going to use the slides as a prompt but uh, doesn't seem to be able to do it that way so I'll uh, I'll ask uh, I'll ask some questions and then we'll take it from there but just bear with us a second are you, are you there Lindsay? Hi, can you hear me? Hi. Hi, oh, I'm really, really sorry about that. It just, uh, it just basically stopped working on me. Right, okay. um, but, but rather than, rather than, uh, rather than rely on the, uh, rather than rely on the slides, shall, shall we just um, talk, talk about, uh, talk about some of the, some of the themes uh, from Williams, and then hopefully I can reintroduce this. If I can get them back, uh, we, we can reintroduce them. We can reintroduce them over the course of of what we're going to talk about. Yeah, yeah, that yeah, that'll be fine. And then yeah, uh, yeah. We'll, we'll 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 try it that way. Yeah. Uh, okay. So well, yeah, <laughs> we'll, we'll do a, we'll do Sorry a, about a very that. quick. It's okay. We'll do a very quick change. We had prepared some questions to ask as well. Uh, yeah, and if anyone's yeah. got questions during during the discussion and, and 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 your talk, then please put them in the in the Q and A in the the chat function. So maybe you could because you're going to start talking about. Uh, your discussions with Don Foster on Williams and the uses of Williams to you, to you both, and and the, yeah. and the relevance of border country. I know we've spoke about that in the past uh, uh, as well. Could you say something about the relevance of border country, Williams's first novel, to your own thinking and your writing, and how that ties in with the work of Don? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, uh, border country is, is is a book that I've returned to constantly over the last 10 or 15 years probably reading it at least once a year um and it it's it's a book that d just repays repeated reading i think for anybody who um for anybody who's seeking to understand you know kind of personal feelings of of dislocation and personal feelings of trying to tie up strands tie up strands of feeling of, of difficult feeling that they may have left a place with in order to go to another place um and the thing that that, that, that i talked about with dawn and i know that she talked about with other uh with other writers um the writer uh, maddock cairns wrote an extraordinary piece um after Dawn's death for the tablet magazine about her and their conversations about border country um, and it's a book that I think because it seems to resonate so strongly with with younger people both both Maddox Cairns and, and Dawn were significantly uh, younger than me I think what it kind of speaks to is a a disillusionment and a trying to sort of come to terms with a disillusionment that comes from striking out, um, believing that things can be better and somehow being encouraged and at once sort of tacitly discouraged from uh, doing that striking out and sort of making your optimism real and concrete through geographical mobility i think um and realizing that not only do you just take yourself with you wherever you go but that that, that there are there are certain things that you leave behind that can't ever be that can't ever be replicated in the new place there are feelings and relationships that can never be replicated in new places um i mean just earlier today i was reading um i was reading uh, uh williams's interview with uh terry eagleton that's um published i think in resources of hope he said well as as Cap williams said as as capital as capital moves on then the importance of place starts to uh, the importance of place starts to make itself known starts to be revealed um and i think for both for me and dawn it had a, a specific resonance in that we both 
had Welsh heritage, specifically South Welsh heritage. Um, Dawn was from Newport, uh, but was of Irish heritage. And I grew up in Birmingham um, with with grand with uh, grandparents from from Neath and Mardi and the valleys, respectively. Um, and just everything about that novel rings true across generations. I think that's the significance of it. Um, and I think, uh, you know, for Dawn, who was kind of heavily involved in, in social, you know, with social media and so on, would kind of use these themes in, in her journalistic work, but also would pick up on things like, for instance, the fact that um, the the quote, uh, you know, the slow and shocking cancellation of the future that I think initially was attributed to Antonio Berardi, uh, the... Um, the autonomous thinker and then was belatedly attributed to Mark Fisher um, actually came from border country. <laughs> and I think I picked up on that and she picked up on that. And um, it was something that sounds so incredibly uh, straightforwardly of, of, of the current moment of the present moment. Uh, and yet was written in 1960. Um so, so these were the things that we shared, and, and it, as as well as as well as you know, as well as the sort of the the, the aspects of, of of sort of you know relationships complicated by class and relationships complicated by the fact of you know work relations and gender relations that are covered in border country. I think it was also the fact that um, it, it's it's about um you know the disruption of education you know the disruption of of further and higher education um which we both went through and which innumerable people have gone through i mean dawn was of uh really of a generation kind of later than me i went to university just about when it was still free uh and she nominally didn't have to pay in the sense that she got a scholarship to Warwick University but but still emerged from university with a, a, a you know an insurmountable level of debt that again compromised her ability to make the contribution that 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 we both knew and that everybody who knew her knew that she was capable of making you know when you're stymied by debt and you're stymied by the fear of you know not being able to pay your rent it affects your, you know, it affects the ability, it affects your ability to, to, to think freely, it affects your ability to, to, to work freely, you know, the work, the work and life decisions that you make are completely dominated by it. And all these things that sort of resonate through, uh, resonate not only through border country, but through so much, so much else of Williams's work. And I think we both related that quite directly often back to, um, you know, the experience of coming from whether literally or, you know, via, via heritage, you know, two generations back from, from South Wales. And what about kind of, uh, there's a lot of similarities you've drawn out there between yourself and Dawn and Williams and the novel. What about the differences, particularly around gender and gender relations, as you mentioned, and, and age as well? Yeah. Um, well, um, I think I think reading Williams seems to. I mean, I remember when I was at oh, you know, I was at university twenty five more than twenty five years ago, and and to read uh, Williams at that time was to think of him sort of quite, I think quite specifically, uh, you know, as as a purely sort of academic thinker and to think of him in terms of his writing you know uh, on um to think of cultural you know his work as a drama critic as in culture and society and so on um one thing that, that that me and dawn quite regularly talked about was the generational differences uh in terms of what we remembered and what we experienced um you know, I, th I think Dawn related a lot of her frustration with politics uh, and a lot of her frustrations with, with life, uh, you know, sort of lived in the sort of 
you know, the, the long, you know, the, the, the sort of the long neoliberal period, you know, attributed them to a lot of the, a lot of, you know, the disappointments and the angers of, of what New Labour did and failed to do. Uh, whereas, you know, my sort of political formation was, was much more to do with Thatcherism and the fact that I was, you know, 21 before a Labour government was even elected. Um, and I think for younger, for younger writers and for younger scholars, uh, Williams seems to be the person who embodies a lot of the uh, a lot of the gap that was experienced by people who supported uh, for instance you know supported Jeremy Jeremy Corbyn's leadership of the Labour Party um, in the sense that you know for, for people who did think that Corbyn was a good idea and that Corbynism was a, was a good idea um, it was a case of I think for a lot of younger people who were curious about the history and curious about the sort of the the, the history of the, the, the sort of the, the theory behind it had to reach back to to um you know two generations rather than a single generation because anybody basically anybody who was my age was um you know harking back to uh, you know wishing that they could have Tony Blair back <laughs> you know and sort of you weren't really going to um. You know, if you were a supporter of Corbyn, you weren't really going to um, find what you wished for and find what you'd hoped for in terms of an articulation of uh, an articulation of, of, of hope and how you make that concrete in, uh, you know, the collected works of Peter Mandelson, you know. So, uh, <laughs> um, and I think, you know, at a time of, you know, a lot of, you know, argument and sort of contestation of, um, you know, how, how you know, backgrounds and identities and, and, you know, different aspects of identity, you know, come, come to inform people's work and come to inform, um, you know, how people interpret uh, people's work. Um, I think it's possible, as with Richard Hoggart, who is another writer that that is absolutely formative, has been absolutely formative to to my writing and my thinking. Um, you can find ways to um, you can find ways to read Williams, you know, without thinking, oh, well, that's a man. What would he know? <laughs> you know, it's where there are ways to you know to um, to read it, you know, to to read his work you know, as a, as a woman, um, and to find, you know, and to find commonality and to find, as I say, to find succour and to find, you know, sort of food for, you know, kind of food for action, really. Uh, you know, you know, regardless of the fact that, you know, he was, you know, uh, a white man of the last century. <laughs> so, uh, it's interesting you say that kind of there's uh looking looking back and kind of uh skipping a generation almost to find the the hope in williams's williams's writing some of the the ways in which he's been discussed uh to mark the centenary was saying that he's not uh, he, he's not as kind of well known or his work isn't as relevant today because he seems to be speaking from a a different period you know a uh kind of pre-Thatcherite period or yeah. early 80s period when I, yeah. you know and I would uh, kind of push against that uh, yeah. and it, and it you can some of some of the things you've just been talking about is there's uh there's there's more from of Williams's work that's relevant particularly you know within uh, debates around socialism and political action today so could yeah. you say something more about that about uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be specifically on that topic, but about the hope within Williams's work, because this is something that many many people take from his writing, uh, and maybe unusual, <laughs> unusual yeah. on the on the le on the left uh, in some in some extent to some extent. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, well, can I just return? Can I just return to some of the slides that I uh, put together, and, and hopefully I might actually be able to, you know, display. Yeah, them. yeah. If, if it doesn't crash, if it doesn't crash the whole if thing I can't again, display yeah. Them, yeah. If I can't display yeah. them, then I'll just read from them. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, but in terms of, I, I'm not. Hang on. I'm not showing the screen now, am I? That's not showing the screen now, is it? No, not yet. Oh, no. But no. okay, that's okay. <laughs> 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 
Um, well, to go back to go back to Williamson, to go back to Williamson Hoggart, um, I don't think it, it took me a long time to realise just how sort of little direct interaction they'd had with each other. Um, but then I discovered that uh, the New Left Review archive contains a transcript of a, uh, an interview with uh, between the two of them in 1959. Uh, and I found it absolutely extraordinary uh, in the light of especially sort of very, very recent, uh, you know, sort of statements or speeches made by both, you know, the current prime minister and the current leader of the opposition. The, the sorts of things that they were discussing about about the nature of, you know, sort of uh, the Labour Party and, and, and big C conservatism um, in 1959, which again was a, another point where the Tories had been in power for a very long time. Um, Labour seemed to be all over the place and it is true, I often think of um, Keir Starmer has been the Hugh Gates skill of the present day Labour Party and therefore doomed not to win <laughs> doomed never to win an <laughs> and doomed never to win a general election but uh, uh, William said to Hoggart um, the emphasis that the Conservatives put is quite strong and attractive that the competitive society is a good thing, that the acquisitive society is a good thing, and that all the style of modern living is satisfying and a real aim in life. They seem to believe these things a lot more strongly than the Labour Party believes in anything. Labour seems the Conservative Party in feeling, and it's bound to remain so unless it really analyses this, this society. Not to come to terms with it, but to offer some deep and real alternative of a new kind. So that's what uh, that's what um, uh, Williams said to Hoggart in conversation. You know, when they're in conversation together in 1959, and it struck me that um, obviously that that Labour, uh, having started to present. Uh, a, a real and, and concrete and, and, and deep, as you said, deep alternative um, in the period between 2015 and 2019. Um, I've just completely reneged on that again. And the Tories have become, in their own very peculiar way, um, attractive, attractive again, and have a sort of, a sort of, a very weird seeming but still sort of quite tangible sort of sense of a wind sort of progress behind them you know that 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 you know that johnson is kind of willing into being through pure you know through pure waffle but is still doing it whereas labor is you know does seem you know more small c conservative in lots of ways in its sense of it's it's just kind of utter caution um and I think I think Dawn Foster's writing in the sort of, in that twenty fifteen to twenty nineteen period was extraordinarily persuasive and powerful in terms of making you know ideas that that, that were constantly uh, pushed back you know, in, in the, the mainstream media that she worked in, constantly pushed back on as being, you know, sort of radically leftist, as being unachievable, as being, you know, basically communism, you know, and basically put them forward in such a sort of, um, not just willfully, willfully hopeful way, but, uh, but just a sort of, you know, a, a, a practically hopeful way in a way that I think um you know Williams sort of helped her, helped her to do that and I think you know when when, when Dawn died I wrote um a piece of, of, about about her about her work and about our relationship for 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 Jacobin magazine and I said in that that you know that that although I did find her you know she was about a foot taller than me you know she's about you know very very tall I'm very very short 
and I would always feel a little bit scared next to her because she seemed so confident in her beliefs and so solid in them. Uh, and I decided at some point to find that <laughs> necessary for, for me to have the sort of the courage to get behind that project myself. You know, I grew up in, I grew up in, you know, sort of cautious times where simply to get rid of that, to, to simply to get rid of the Tories, you know, seemed like the, the overwhelming objective of any Labour government. It almost didn't matter what a Labour government did as long as they weren't the Tories. And over time, it, it you know, over time, the, the realisation, you know, sank in that it, it simply wasn't enough just to be not the Tories, that it was very, very important to have a project that you could build on, even if everybody wasn't on board with that project to begin with. You had to have the project in order to articulate it, to persuade people, to invite people to come on board with it and make their contribution. And Dawn's writing, you know, particularly, you know, for the, for the Guardian, for 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 Jacobin, and initially for Tribune when Tribune relaunched in twenty eighteen, the articles that she wrote, um, made that seem the obvious option, you know, for anybody, for anybody who, for whom, you know, New Labour had been, you know disappointing disenchanting just you know disenchanting making um you know enraging but for whom you know the the, the election of, of Corbyn to leader in in 2015 was an absolute curveball and you know if you were about 40 you didn't know what to make of it at all because if you'd ever had anything to do with the Labour Party Jeremy Corbyn had very sort of specific connotations <laughs> um to get on board with that was was it was it, it was you know it was an act of hope and, and and dawn's writing made that you know eminently um possible seeming you say in your your tribute to dawn in the in jacobin that she never got comfortable enough to forget that poverty is a political choice inflicted by those who don't live it so poverty is a political choice inflicted by those who don't live it. Could you say something more about that? Particularly, it seems resonant today and this week and, and ever ever more important to talk about the, the agency behind these choices that uh, that inflict poverty, uh, inflict yeah. poverty on those people, yeah. Yeah, of course, yeah, yeah. Um, well, another another key figure for for both Dawn and and for me in terms of our writing and and thinking on on politics, uh, politics and and society really. Um, uh, you know, I think one of the things that we both wanted to try and do was to kind of bring the ideas of the to bring the findings of social sciences and social policy, you know, right into the heart of, um, you know political journalism to actually take it out of just wittering on about who said what in Westminster you know so the, the key figure for, for both a key figure in that for both of us was Doreen Massey the geographer and I think one it's almost it's almost kind of like mentally sort of like plastered on my sort of you know sort of internal pin board every time I write an article which is that from Doreen Massey from Space Place and Gender which is most people actually live in places like Harleston or West Brom. Much of life for many people, even in the heart of the first world, still consists of waiting in a bus shelter with your shopping for a bus that never comes. Um, and Dawn had, um, you know, the, the, the term lived experience is, 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 you know, kind of way overused these days, but it's, it's difficult to find another way of putting it. But Dawn knew precisely of what she spoke um, and knew when she was writing and reporting about housing, uh, you know, about all the difficulties of insecure housing that was starting to 
become something that didn't just affect you know the very poor but was starting to affect people you know across a very wide range of incomes and occupations the the difficulties of of poor housing of unreliable services um of you know of poverty uh of poverty um not purely in terms of lacking money to get from one week to the next but in terms of how long-term poverty drastically affects every single aspect of your life you know and you know your bodily experience of you know of of, of space um Doreen Massey's writing was was absolutely key and, and also um another geographer Danny Dorling was also key you know, writing about the about these things. And so when she wrote, for instance, she wrote many, many excellent columns for the society section of The Guardian that I think were perhaps not as well read as her pieces for the opinion section, but were incredibly resonant for their incredibly direct and unsentimental accounts of how policy affected her life how policy affected her life as a child how it affected her as an adolescent how they affected her as a student and as they affected her as 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 an adult um as somebody who nominally had been socially mobile you know through formal education somebody who you know some years probably earned you know a reasonably good living but other years you know didn't somebody who was living with the effects of uh, the right to buy because she was somebody who lived in a, in an ex-council flat in London, surrounded by neighbours who were still council tenants who were paying probably a third or a quarter of the rent that she was paying because she was living in a flat that was owned now by a private landlord. You know, all these very, very, very direct effects on her own life and yet wrote about them in a way that um, gave context gave context I think because of her own extremely um you know detailed and long-term reading of the social sciences you know so of, of work in social science um and I think it's the depth of knowledge it, it was a kind of it was a kind of magpie approach it was a magpie approach but at the same time it, it accumulated a very great level of of, of depth of knowledge that is really really lacking in a lot of um journalism and commentary you know that that purports to be about issues in society directly affecting us in society and can you link that to to williams's and williams's writing because i was interested in williams as a writer and what what kind of resources you find in Williams is in terms of the way he wrote and, 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 and writing as a form of communication and different types of writing and also the the kind of autobiographical material that Williams would often use, I guess, lightly, but uh, on a regular basis and then yeah. use it to to draw much kind of broader political points. So the country and the city starting with a personal reflection and then looking at a, you know, a much broader, longer historical process. Uh, could you say something about the, those things in terms of uh, the, the what you took from Williams and then and yeah. then how you would use that in your own work? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, it's interesting, really, because I suppose, you know, my sort of twin, you know, sort of twin major influences are, are Ray, Raymond Williams and Richard Huggett. And, and Huggett always referred him, to himself as a, as a centripetal you know he said he said you know he believed that there were centrifugal writers and centripetal writers and he regarded himself as a centripetal writer in terms of how um he would take larger themes he would take sort of broader political themes broader social changes um you know the products of the products of mass media and the products of you know popular you know local popular culture and um relate them back to his own life he would always come back to his life and his own experiences and those things would inform how he then wrote about his own experiences whereas i think it, the opposite perhaps was the case for williams you know he was he was more of a centripetal 
writer. So, you know, I suppose like, you know, the the, the Winnie the, the, the phrase from Winnicott, um, home is where we start from, you know, so we would start from there. You know, at the beginning of politics and letters, you know, it says I come from Pandy. And then at the very beginning of the very beginning of culture is ordinary, which is an absolutely key piece of writing for me. You know, culture is ordinary. That is where we must start. You know, is waiting at the bus stop. Actually, the you know the the use the it, it's it's the um the recurring theme of the bus stop. I think that <laughs> that that uh, I think is the thread running through all these things. You know that with culture is ordinary starting with him waiting at the bus stop outside the cathedral um you know Doreen Massey with the uh, invocation of people waiting at bus stops and and also the, of course the first line of border country which is um as he ran for the bus he was glad you know they, they, so I think with as I say with with Hoggart I think it's it's centripetal in that he he, he thinks about the wider things and then comes back to his own life whereas I think with Hoggart uh, sorry with Williams um he's starting he's starting with the personal journey and then almost in sort of concentric circles the themes become broader and broader and broader um and I, I'm not quite sure whether I'm centrifugal or centripetal in terms of using personal experience to inform to inform um, what I write about and what interests me, but I think it's that idea of the sort of the the layering, the layering of concentric circles. You know, building out from building out from you know your your, your personal memories, your personal experiences. You know, the sensory experiences almost and then thinking about you know you're waiting you know culture is ordinary you're waiting at the bus stop you're thinking about where the bus is going to go to thinking about you know thinking about what borders you're going to cross along the way thinking about the industrial and you know and the the, the, the colonial processes that you know that led to that led to those border that led to those borders and then coming back again i suppose turning back on yourself then to sort of working out how you know the structures of feeling that all those influences and layers that are built up then come back to reverberate on your future experience i suppose and your 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 sort of your anticipation of what comes next Right. Okay. Thanks. So, well, I probably asked too many questions, and hopefully, we've been able to recreate part of the talk that you were yeah. giving. Yeah. Uh, I, I will. I will attempt to retrieve it, and if anybody, if anybody <laughs> wants to, if if anybody wants to have it afterwards, then then I can always then I can always supply you know via via Phil. And if anyone wants to ask any questions, please put them in the the chat uh, or. There's a raise your hand function as well on the reactions button that if anyone wants to, to speak and ask a question directly. David Alderson has put something in the chat about Corbynism and social democracy. David, did you want to ask a question based on that at all? Hi, Lindsay. Hi, everyone. Yeah, I thought Hi. thank you for, for your comments this evening. Um, yeah, it's just something that as you were speaking, it reminded me of a talk that uh, Colin Lees was was giving at uh, the Historical Materialism Conference. And uh, and it just seemed to me that that emphasis on social democracy, using social democracy to go beyond social democracy, um, resonates with so much in Williams's work about the deepening of democracy mm -hmm. um, uh, and the extension of it. Uh, in a way which is kind of obviously indebted to the social democratic, the post-war social democratic project, but which is not in any way um, full of illusions about it and recognizes mm -hmm. perfectly well its limitations. Mm -hmm. Just, just, just um, it seemed to me a good way of thinking about um, the affinities between the two. And, and also, I just wonder, uh, th th these are not questions, these are things that thoughts that occur to me but I, maybe you have some comments to make on them I just wonder you know in the same way that now we find people going back and looking at Raymond Williams's work and it, 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 there seems to be a revival of interest in him there was also that kind of unexpected 
uh, retrieval from the past, if you like, of Corbyn himself from, from a, moment, a moment in the 1980s. And I wonder what that says about the way in, in which um, work seems to um, inspire people almost anachronistically or people, individuals mm. inspire people anachronistically. Uh, I, I don't know if you have any kind of thoughts about that, that, that process by which, you know, things from the past um, recur in some sense, ideas, people, thoughts. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, I, I, it's it's funny, you know, because uh, reading so much William, reading so much of Williams's writing, you know, from you know, going back right to the fifties, you know, when he was writing at a time of, uh, you know, you know, he he actually said he, you know, he he actually felt you know unusually pessimistic at that time. You know, because it it felt that uh, it felt that the forty five to fifty one Labour government had not had not succeeded ultimately. You know, and it's interesting to look at it back uh, to look at it from from this far removed because you know we think of it as being a kind of you know <laughs> you know the, the the one shot we had and you know you know we managed to create the NHS and you know build you know half a million council houses and and so on so it looks absolutely extraordinary for, from this vantage point but but for williams uh it, it it's you know he he does actually write or, or say in an interview that that that, that it, he felt incredibly disappointed and disheartened by the end of the the 1950s and i think um i think the reason why williams is is resonating right now and i think particularly with younger people is because they've had this kind of taste of hope they've had this taste of hope whereas uh you know as i was saying you know people of my age you know sort of you know kind of i don't know age between 40 and 50 ish you know <laughs> around about you know around about that kind of age we didn't have the um we didn't have the prospect of you know the, the sort of the restoration of the full social democratic project um as as a, as a means of hope as i was saying before it was more a case of we just got to get with the program get with the program uh you know accept what we can accept what we can possibly achieve but also underlyingly you know sort of whether resentfully or otherwise you know accept that you know the the the, the argument's been won that history really has ended there really is no alternative um and you know sort of watery <laughs> kind of watery neoliberalism with extra spending was the best we could hope for you know um and i think with williams i, I read um you know i'm sure many people here read um Lola Seaton's uh, essay about Williams in uh, the New Statesman a few weeks ago, around the time of uh, Williams's um, centenary, uh, and it and it really really struck me just what an extraordinarily um, engaged undertaking that was for somebody so young. Because you know, as, as far as I'm aware, Lola Seaton is about twenty five, something like that. I don't know, under thirty certainly. Um, and the seriousness with which uh, she engaged with Williams's project as a writer, you know, project and projects as a writer uh, about the very, very, very serious engagement with um, all the different fragments of hope that you can sort of gather together out of a seemingly hopeless situation um and i think that is something that uh younger people were sort of you know really 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 latched onto in the corbyn period um and that as i say you know people of my age you know seem to think just wasn't possible anymore and and if uh, you know if people were saying it was possible then that was because they were somehow you know fr frivolous or deluded um and you know at a time of you know extremely you know grave literally sort of existential threats you know coming from you know coming from uh you know coming from 
the climate, uh, you know, climate change and, and so on, um, to assert hope and to assert the prospect of something different and better and to try and sort of continually assert that is a major major project it's a project for individuals because it because it's so easy to lose hope every day or to not have it every day but it's 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 a project that you have to try and that you have to try and articulate and put out there so that other people know that you feel hope and therefore they can possibly get more hope from that too and so I think this sort of reading and sharing of Williams's work by younger people um is a source of hope for me you know it's 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 a powerful it's a powerful thing um you know going back to uh going back to Maddox Cairns's piece um for the tablet um about Dawn and about the things that they shared in reading Williams sorry I'm gonna go back to my I'm gonna go back to my aborted powerpoint and just read off what it said so in the practice of possibility williams wrote about saying if i say estimating for example whether we'll avoid a nuclear war uh, this is right in the 80s uh this is speaking in the 1980s i see it as 50 50 i instantly make it 51 49 or 60 40 the wrong way that's why I say we must speak for hope <coughs> as long as it doesn't mean suppressing the nature of the danger. <coughs> and picking up on this, Maddock wrote of Dawn, you know, of her insistence on hope and of her insistence of holding on to the one hopeful thing out of what appears to be an irredeemable mess. He wrote, against the current ahead of the curve, 50-50, bad odds, but they'll get better. 51-49, roll away that stone. 60-40, the night's not over yet. Uh, and it's just, it, 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 it's, it's just powerful and emotive and important. To, to, to speak like that, to, to, to talk like that at a time when, <coughs> you know, so many people have actively sought to crush the, 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 the very idea, the very idea that, that something like, you know, the Corbyn McDonnell project um, as, as, you know, as, as, as reasonable and as and as anything near to the, the sort of the, the the task ahead of us. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> yeah, they weren't questions. Sorry. All <laughs> oh, right. Yeah. 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 I suppose so. Does anyone else have a, a question? There is a question in the chat. I could. I could have put to you. Mm -hmm. uh, well, yeah, I'll put this question to you, Lindsay, and then please feel free for anyone else to ask questions. I was <coughs> put in the chat to add questions in the chat, but also use the reactions function to, to alert me to, to if you want to ask a question directly as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so Tom May says, Williams is incredibly wide ranging in certain areas of his work where they get mentioned. What do you make of his writings about the environment uh, and, and uh, all, I suppose, about television? Uh, yeah. And that touches, I guess, on some of your interests as well on popular culture and Williams's the uses of Williams's writing and thinking about popular culture as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, well, uh, I think um, I think with read together, read together, I think Hogger and Williams um, give a sort of a, a fuller picture. Uh, then I think then had I just had I just read Williams um, in terms of in terms of the engagement of you know kind of serious scholars you know and sort of political thinkers on on the impact of popular culture. Um, I know that uh, I know sorry I know that Williams was um, a TV critic for the Listener. Was that right? Yeah, TV critic for for the Listener. And I know that I think Joe Moran is here. 
in the chat if he wants to contribute to the chat. I know that Joe Moran has a, a has written wrote quite extensively about uh, about Williams's uh, engagement with um, with TV, but um, I think from more from reading um, communications um, and the Long Revolution um, and culture is ordinary. Um, I think I sort of, I think I gained a, gained a sense that, you know, I'm somebody who grew up just completely and utterly, um, you know, just, you know, steeped. I don't know if that's not even, that doesn't even describe it, you know, just kind of, uh, just, just, just kind of absorbed in popular culture. And, and mm, that was my point of reference for absolutely everything growing up um you know the sort of the you know the levisite demarcation between sort of high and low didn't really exist for me because i didn't really know about i didn't really know about the high stuff until introduced to it through uh the various sort of popular cultural portals uh such as you know such as song lyrics and uh song lyrics and um uh pop stars uh uh quoting from quoting from books they'd read and listing their favorite books in uh you know in publications that no longer exist um but i think i think i i think i engage more readily with hoggart you know for instance you know in the uses of literacy because he's talking about even though he has to make up some of the examples you know he's talking about very very um tangible archetypes of you know poor quality fiction uh, of um you know mass produced uh you know mass produced pop music you know sort of um so kind of factory written pop music and so on and these were sort of tropes that I recognized from when I was from from when I was growing up and it was later on reading Williams and getting more of a sense of what Williams was was reaching for in terms of Believing, I think, you know, I suppose hopefully, again, believing um, in the democratising possibilities of popular culture and in, you know, in and in mass broadcast media, that I began to have a bit less of a, a sort of an automatically snobby attitude to, you know, to, to what I thought was good and what I thought was bad. And what I thought was a poor quality in popular culture, uh, I think I'm, from reading Williams, um, you know, on, you know, mass broadcast media, I think in particular, I think I began to realise that, you know, particularly in that time, you know, growing up, you know, in the seventies, eighties, nineties, at a time of, you know, a lot of very high quality. Um, arts pro <clears throat> sorry arts programming and drama and um uh you know and the availability of uh foreign language films for instance on you know on um first on bbc2 and then later on channel four as well all of those i began to realize that all of those things are, are an education in themselves and that if you're you know if you're growing up on a council estate outside birmingham uh, you know that is your education that is your portal those are the things that help you to form your sense of the world outside and that it's actually nothing to be ashamed of to be educated by the telly <coughs> um so you know in terms of his you know very strong belief in the democratizing potential of tv you know and the doc democratizing potential of making you know, media forms available to the largest possible um, audience. Um, I think that was really, really um, formative for me. But but I think I grew up so um, deeply absorbed in in mass media and things like music journalism. You know, things like you know the Enemy and the Melody Maker and things like things that no longer exist. I was so so strongly formed by them that I already had a very very strong sense of um, what they were doing for me before I later on read Williams on these topics and and developed a sense of what they could be doing for society as a whole. 
Um, Great, you know, thanks. Hope, yeah. Yeah, I don't know if Tom wants to come back on that or if anyone else has got any uh, any questions. It's interesting with Williams when he 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 uh, he teaches one police drama as it's being broadcast and teaches it at Cambridge. So I can't recall the name of it now off the top of my head, but it's as it's being broadcast, I think. And, you know, it, it's very kind of offering crit critiques as it almost live uh, and taking it that, seri that, that seriously, you know, in, in real time. Uh, yeah. And there's a lot, you know, a lot of his writings are about television. And I suppose there's many Williamses, isn't there? So uh, part of Tom's question was about the environment as well. And and that's one one way in which people have, engage and find great value in Williams's work, this writing on eco-socialism. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I can stop waffling on now because we've got another question uh, or comment <laughs> in the chat from Adam Gans. Ultimately, Williams was much more connected to theory than Hoggart. He combined an understanding of popular culture with his deep knowledge of literature and Marxist theory. Uh, do you think that remains important or does theory happen elsewhere like Doreen Massey or, or Danny Darling? So I know that's something you've considered. We've spoken about before, isn't it, Lindsay? The differences between Williams and Hogger and 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 the theoretical, I guess, differences. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I mean, because I don't, I don't think Hogger was 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 automatically kind of anti-theory. I think it just came a lot back to, you know, I mean, differences in personality. I mean, you know, that's brought out in, the, as I say, you know, the NLR conversation, um, uh, where you know they're, they're very very clearly discussed with each other the fact that you know Williams came from a I suppose a kind of a you know a, a, a vertically integrated society you know village society where um, people from people with different occupations and sort of different levels of income basically all felt as good as each other and he internalized that sense of oh, I'm as good as anybody else very, very strongly um, and was a much, much more confident figure than Hoggart. I think Hoggart, you know, you know, describes growing up in, in you know, in Hunslet in a quite sort of deracinated environment in terms of, uh, you know, his link to, you know, his link to rural Yorkshire being, you know, a couple of generations removed. You know, and everything sort of centred around, you know, the very, very small scale local neighbourhood. But it was very sort of class, demar very class and income demarcated. And Hogger always lacked, Hogger always lacked confidence and worked and worked and worked, I think, to try and gain a sense of confidence. Whereas I think Hogger, or, uh, sorry, Williams always began with that sense of confidence. And I think that affects how that affects what they then went on to do with their work, you know, that sense of whether they were centripetal or centrifugal. You know, I think Hogger, uh, sorry, Williams was much more readily able to expand out into theory uh, and to make the kind of pronouncements, I think, you know, the sort of the theory informed uh, pronouncements that Hoggart just wouldn't have had the confidence in himself to make, you know, and would continually sort of take it back to his own experience, I think, because he lacked the confidence to integrate his observations uh, and his assessments of, you know, of things like mass media and, and, uh, and, and, you know, sort of value, you know, sort of class, class values kind of thing um, to integrate them into, you know, into something like uh, Marxist, uh, you know, Marxist uh, theory. Um, whereas I think Williams had the, had the confidence to do that because he didn't see why he shouldn't, you know. Um, I think, um you know, with with Massey and 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 Dawling, um, I suppose, you know, we, you know, I think I think both me and Dawn, as I say, had had and have a real desire to bring as much of the, um, you know, the findings and knowledge gained from the academic social sciences, you know, whether it's you know whether it's geography. Uh, you know, geography, uh, sociology, social policy research, um, uh, you know, and political and political theory into a not a digestible format, but in a in a format that you know, in a format that 
isn't going to get automatically kind of struck out of an article if you write it, you know, to basically put it in terms that are as um, readable, you know, easily readable and sort of pass, you know, passable um, as, uh, you know, as, as, as writing something a lot less, you know, a, a lot less, um, you know, sort of weighted with, with you know, with academic uh, knowledge. Great, thanks. Uh, uh, any other any other questions for Lindsay? One thing I would like to ask, actually, that relates to Lola Seaton's article, uh, and I think was one of the dangers in some maybe misunderstandings of Williams's work is. Uh, how do we push against the kind of the rights appropriation or uses and abuses of, of place and, uh, and class and uh, and the problems with some of the problems with defining community and Williams's writing on community? Yeah, because Lola Seaton touches on that, doesn't she, in the in the article, the kind of the things that we take from Williams are things that we don't and, and, and maybe misunderstandings around what Williams meant by community and, and what yeah. significance he, he, he placed on place and class. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, well, I think, I think again, I think that also comes back to confidence. Um, I think, I think it is possible. It is possible to confidently assert, um, you know, a a politics or a political worldview that is, um, that is confidently, you know from you know sort of informed by place and informed by experience and informed by a sense of well this is what community meant to me when I was growing up and this is what community means to me now in the place where I live and to do that confidently and assertively I think it's when you lose your nerve and you start deferring to other people's definitions to other people's definitions of, of class and place and community that you start to sort of get in a muddle um i mean you see this sort of constantly um you know in in you know in the, the labor party's kind of struggles to um you know, as I say, you know, that Williams quote, you know, as capital moves on, place becomes more important. You know, I mean, a lot, so many Labour MPs, and so many significant Labour figures are, you know, with with the with the exception of Redwall, you know, fallen, with the exception of fallen seats, you know, still have seats that, that are directly affected by deindustrialization and where people don't have to try and maintain a positive sense of place without the work that contributed to that said that specific sense of place at the time and I think they tie themselves up in knots basically deferring deferring to um uh, uh quite sort of closed notions of place and quite closed notions of community and when I read Williams you know, when I read Williams talking about Pandy, you know, when I read Williams talking about, um, you know, talking about, uh, you know, his parents, you know, in the railway and, and so on, I never get a sense of that being closed or defensive at all. And I think that's where you can sort of push back those, push back against those kind of misinterpretations because um, he's very, very firmly placing those experiences in, you know, in, in historical context, you know, political context, in the context of trade unionism, you know, in the context of, uh, you know, sort of gender, gender relationships in a kind of semi-rural um, area. And then it, it's, it's something that it's something that's transferable, you know, that, that, that confident sense of place is, is transferable. And so it can be used potentially by anyone um, you know, assertive. You know, like I say, assertively rather than defensively. Yeah, 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 yeah. And David, David <laughs> also spoke earlier, just made the, made the point as well, saying that you know a lot of the criticism of Williams comes from Gil Paul Gilroy's uh, critique of Williams, particularly mm. Williams writing in towards two thousand. Mm. Uh, did you want to break come in there, David, at all? 
Um, well, no, I, I was just not really. I was just responding to what you were to what you were saying. Uh, yeah, and thinking about how that resonates with the present as well. That you know what what Gilroy effectively says about about Williams is that there's a kind of insular and nostalgic kind of vision of community, um, one which which is hostile to movement and to migration, mm-hmm. and there is that element in in uh, Williams's work. But I, I would that element of hostility to towards uh, movement and and the hostility of of, of of capital to place. But it is I think hostility to capital as such rather than to uh, migration. Um, and you know it, it's 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 interesting because it seems to me that you know it speaks to a kind of quandary that that, that we feel in, in 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 the present kind of moment where where we, if we are on the left, obviously tend to be in favour of 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 defending migrants' rights and 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 so on and and a, a certain kind of cosmopolitan openness, but but at the same time, of course, we're aware that even those things are bound up with the circuits of capital and, and the, the pressures on people to move around, not necessarily freely, but, but, to, but, to, but, to, but, to, but to follow where the money is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the thing is, I mean, you know, I, I, you know, I don't detect any kind of hostility to, to migration as such in Williams because, because he himself, you know, like he, at the very beginning of politics and letters, you know, he starts talking about how many of his relatives moved to Birmingham you know it's like you know it, it it migration isn't sort of a, a good or bad it is an is you know it is something that happens you know in in conditions of you know necessity and need and so you know that movement you know because that's my you know the story of my own family as well moving from south wales to birmingham you know to work in factories and domestic service and so on you know i mean he, he was absolutely strongly related to those things and also you know in um uh you know in border country to go back to to go back to border country you know his initial you know matthew price's initial sort of positive reaction on this sort of yucky wet london evening on the bus is with you know is with um you know a presumably recently recently migrated um a caribbean bus conductor bus conductress um and you you know, again, you know, that could be read as, you know, quite, uh, you know, kind of, you know, random and tokenistic and so on. But it, but it's it's an interaction. It's an interaction that they experience. And to me, that is an early, you know, given that it was written in 1960, that is precisely, you know, an early sort of iteration of exactly what Paul Gilroy himself talks about, which is, you know, conviviality, conviviality in an urban setting that is... Um, you know that's brought about by city life by people coming to cities from totally different places from using the buses you know from using the buses together from being on you know from being on streets together from getting on trains together and so on so it's interesting that uh, Gilroy uh, has criticized it because um, I I think you know I think I think Williams does you know, express quite directly that sort of conviviality, um, you know, in a number of different, um, you know, in a number of different settings, you know. Yeah, I mean, there's 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 a brilliant passage in his, he's got an essay, um, I think it's in Resources of Hope on key words of the, mi- of the minor strike, the 84 mm. minor strike. And, uh, you know, he has a long passage on Ian McGregor, uh, mm. a, about him as mm. being a plastic nomad you know <laughs> from place to place under the flag of convenience and just taking the money and moving on to the next place and causing destruction and then you know so th- that seems to me to be the kind of movement the the, the mm. negative uh destructive movement that he's thinking about rather mm. than migration of people you know having to move around for work primarily for reasons of work yeah exactly exactly yeah yeah that that it's it's um it's it's the necessity of it it's it's the it's the sort of the 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 disrupt you know the disruption caused by need that uh, that he criticizes rather than the, rather than the fact that it happens yeah definitely um and it, sorry i'm just reading this i'm just reading this quote oh you can see that right yeah okay. yeah place for Williams was networked well exactly yeah 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 yeah, yeah.
that absolutely that 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 says everything to me because you know I'm partly partly influenced by by personal experience but also partly influenced by by border country I've been trying for several years to, to write a book about public transport and about um the sort of the connections between geographical mobility and social mobility uh ge geographical and social mobility and also about infrastructure you know about transport infrastructure the way it makes these things possible you know it encourages these things because one of the key passages from border country to me is uh is the i can't remember his name one of the farmer i think the the, the farmer character that says you know all these people going up and down in the going up and down in trains or all, all they're going to do is come back <laughs> and um you know there's that thing about sort of uh you know this this you know this is written about so much as well you know in um you know by people like walter benjamin and, and joseph broth you know in, in 30s berlin you know like the infrastructure is there the migration you know the, the necessity for migration is there you know the, the infrastructure for migration is there uh you know once once you're all in the city all that's left to do is travel around on this new infrastructure you know uh um you know sort of do doing doing some things out of necessity but also doing some things just because you can do them now because because the, because the uh you know the, the means of mobility is there now um so yeah yeah i mean it's 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 absolutely key for me that that you know that williams's father was uh worked worked on the railways because it gave him a sense of you know it gave him a sense of what was outside you know it gave him a sense of uh you know that that you that that you lived in a place but it was also a place connected connected to other places you know that would have shared some shared experiences you know some very very different experiences but the point is, is they were all that they were all connected that they're all potentially continuously connected okay just got a few minutes left if anyone's got any final uh any final burning questions Is there anything we've not covered, Lindsay, that you wanted to to mention? Seems though you you weren't able to deliver the what what was planned. Then. Oh yes, yeah. Um, well, let me see if I can again retrieve the uh, retrieve the um, retrieve the slides. Um, No, I think really, I think I think the one thing that I did want to talk about that I never quite got to cover just, you know, ju just now really was about um, sort of building on this, you know, building on, you know, the structures of, you know, the structures of feeling idea and relating it to, um, you know, relating it to, to Dawn's life and also to to, to, to people in general now was a, a sense of, a sense of, and a need for structures of care you know of practical practical structures of care and also structures of care sort of made evident in writing really you know like what i was saying earlier about you know gaining so much um sort of you know positive feeling really and um a sense of you know a sense of potential from reading how much younger people are connecting with Williams's work and, and being so serious about it and being so engaged with it, it makes me really, really hopeful that uh you know if 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 there is a sense that, you know, kind of like hope isn't hope isn't lost after this, you know, absolutely you know, really tremendous um upset and disappointment of you know the 2019 election and um you know and starmer um though i never trusted him in the first place you know <laughs> starmer becoming leader and and so on um it, it's holding on to those things and maybe starting to sort of get an idea of um understanding understanding what what you know what a structure of care <laughs> uh what a structure of care 
might actually look like in terms of enabling people once again I think you know because I think these possibilities have sort of cropped up um you know in earlier periods you know in earlier um you know in earlier sort of historical periods you know saying that you know from the post-war period onwards is, is the development of a better and a new structure of care for people that enables people to make their full contribution uh you know in the sense that in the senses that, that, that Williams and Hoggart imagined it you know is that you, you can't have you know you can't have this sort of continuously you know evolving and developing uh democratizing culture uh, if people are so consistently hobbled by the fact that everything has collapsed on you know the responsibility for everything has collapsed onto individuals so you know without a welfare <coughs> you know without a, a properly functioning welfare state you know one of one of the great you know genuinely great um one of the genuinely great things about um the you know the, the new labor periods you know for for all there were difficulties with that even but one of the genuinely great things about the new labor period is i experienced it as a as a as a new mother at the very 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 end of the new labor period was the existence of children's centers and the the the, the development and further investment in in children's centers um, because they they created for the first time in generations really since you know almost since sort of like you know the pilot the pilot sort of communal nurseries you know at the beginning of the national health service and or well, prior to the beginning of the national health service you know actually enabled a place for people to come together and actually be supported properly in an incredibly vulnerable time in their lives regardless of class or income you know and that that had massively positive benefits not just not just for working class women um for for middle class women too you know it is possible you know it's, <laughs> when i you know when i became a parent i realized that you know you can be middle class and still experience struggles you know like as somebody who was socially mobile it was kind of like you know my life up till that point had all been about kind of ooh, living the dream you know <laughs> and then you know, as a, a you know, be, becoming a parent, something like having children's centres actually made it, made it feel like something like that structure of care was available and was actually being built upon, had not just been established recently, you know, in the present period, but was actually getting built upon. It was actually having real benefits for for, for people in their lives. Um, so I suppose to go back to that. Um, you know, for somebody like Dawn, who had a long term condition or had several long term conditions and was, you know, was, was, you know, continually sort of like hobbled in a wish to write. You know, she wants she was planning to write a book about the, the, Gren, the fire at Grenfell Tower. She wanted to write other books, was continually um, hobbled by lack of income um, and lack of formal support structures, you know, beyond you know, sort of, you know, beyond, um, you know, NHS type medical care and beyond a, a friendship network, there were few other structures of support that enabled her to continue making her full contribution, um, you know, from from a position of, of, of vulnerability, from a position of, from a position of poor health. And it's something that I've thought about constantly in the, in the last few months since she died. So I think one sort of, you know, sort of legacy, so to speak, you know, and 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 talking about Williams and and knowing that so many younger people are using reading, using their readings of Williams to actually think about how they, you know, how they think about politics and how they think about society, you know, in the wake of the twenty nineteen election, you know, I mean, actually thinking about, you know you know a structure a structure of care for everyone is is a you know is is one positive thing that might that I hope can sort of come out of this great thanks thanks a lot lindsay uh we're talking about structures of care uh should we end it there or there is another question in the chat if you've got time to address that i know your time is limited this evening 
Uh, yeah. Sorry, I'm just reading. What, I'm just reading yeah, it's building on just what you were saying about about uh, about Kerr and uh, about the value placed on Kerr. Yeah. Uh, crumbs. How long is the long revolution going to take? <laughs> um. Yeah. Um. Well, I mean, yes. I mean, I mean, I mean, the fact, the fact that you know, we clapped rather than. You know, we clapped rather than went on general strike is quite uh, it's quite instructive, really, um, isn't it? But uh, I mean, you know, I mean, in terms of you know the a action that can you know make make the hope concrete, I think really it's just sort of keeping the you know keeping the dream of mild social democracy alive, <laughs> uh, really, and I think not being beaten down but i mean that, that was the thing that was the thing that 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 me and dawn were in constant contact about really was this idea that you know you know we might be fucked but we're not doomed you know <laughs> which is you know like you know every everything everything is terrible but we're not going to let it stop us from believing you know believing that things can change you know and, and a lot of that sort of came out came about from you know the fact that you know that that, that Corbyn's um election to leader sort of basically sort of came out of nowhere really and opened up this absolutely gigantic space for very very serious discussion and planning of what an actual you know what a proper social democratic government might look like and everything that everything that's been discounted and diminished and uh, delegitimized now by Starmer um, is actually there and on paper and, you know, it hasn't been burnt. It still exists, you know, like John McDonnell's documents, you know, John McDonnell's economic documents and, you know, his, you know, models of alternative models of ownership, and, you know, in the 2017 manifesto, they do still exist. You know, they didn't disappear with Starmer. They're still there for us to look at. Um, it's just a matter of, it's just a matter of, um, you know, keep, keep keeping the knowledge of that uh, alive and, and sort of recirculating it until such time as, um, and until such time as uh, <laughs> somebody that's not... Keir Starmer is involved with the the Labour Party. I mean, I know that that seems absolutely impossible at the moment, but I suppose the I suppose the thing is is that you know when I when I was growing up, I never ever imagined a time when the Tories wouldn't be in power, and that they you know they did kind of you know they did sort of stop eventually, and you know and some good things happened, um, amongst many other bad things. But 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 I think it, I think it's just it's just to keep it's to it's to keep sharing this information and not to forget about it. You know, it's the same with uh, you know, for instance, you know, people now sort of revising opinions of the seventies. You know, I grew up with I grew up with uh, you know almost like a mantra that the seventies were terrible. Uh, you know, and it's and it's 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 only in recent years now that the people have actually done the work of. Um, done the work of establishing that the 70s were actually very good for a lot of people particularly working class people um so um so i think it's i, I think it, it's you know it's it's the work of you know historians sociologists you know and and, and then for, for journalists you know like 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 dawn was trying to do you know actually bringing that information and bringing those um findings and uh, recollections and refusals to forget, you know, into into to to a much much wider audience, you know, so that people can gradually sort of have their minds changed and be reminded that there is an alternative. 